Sorry. Okay, anyway, so a formal introduction. My name is Dan Leppard. I'm a associate professor of communication, focusing on media and visual culture at St. Mary's. I'm in the communication department. I have an MFA from the School of Art Institute of Chicago. I also have a PhD from the USC Film School. I've actually written on book, a book on media and education, and my latest thing I'm working on is actually about the formations of the self in relation to media across the 20th century, which draws in film, which draws in uh, print, and I'm focusing mainly on comics and graphic novels. Recently, I'm actually myself doing a graphic narrative around it. So anyway, so Tintin fits into that. So this is how I got associated with Tintin. Anyway, so the, talk of my, the title of my talk is Tintin, Rouge, and the 20th Century, mainly because it, I, I see this sort of uh, Russian Revolution as sort of a key central event in the early part of the 20th century, and Tintin sort of mirrors that uh, trajectory across the 20th century, um, ending up actually in the 70s. But, um, so anyway, so let's start with this. So that's my name. Anyway, so Tintin and the Land of the Soviets is the first album that was put together. A little background on Tintin. So Tintin started out as a comic strip in the um, Catholic magazine. Um, actually, there was a, there's a magazine called 20th Century which had a Catholic focus. Um, Tintin appeared as a, uh, as a comic in the kids' version, which was called, I think it translates as junior or young 20th century. And his first um, outing was as a reporter treated just like a reporter, um, traveling to the um, Soviet Union to talk about what's been going on there. Of course, it's a very, very ideological and polemical um, response because the, the magazine is very conservative, and it really wanted to unmask all the horrors and awfulness of the Soviet Union. So I've got a couple of those awfulnesses right here, actually. So he, and, and the way that, so the first thing is factories. Um, the way this was structured was he would basically get in his car and drive wherever he was going. And, and, uh, and he never did much reporting, but he kind of walked around and had these little episodic adventures that happened. Um, this one is, so he, so he gets to Russia, he meets all these different kinds of characters. Um, and this is one where he's walking along. There's a, a Soviet apparatchnik that basically explained to the people, uh, British uh, socialists, about how wonderful the factories are. And he says, those factories are running a bit too well. Let's see, and he peeks behind a door. And then, sure enough, inside there's an older guy feeding a furnace with hay, and there's a guy clanging on some metal to make it sound like some gears or something are moving. And he's saying, that's how the Soviets fool the poor idiots who still believe in the Red Paradise. So obviously it's meant to as a sort of propaganda, uh, anti-Soviet propaganda. But, well, we've earned dinner, let's, let's go, right? So meanwhile, this is his dog, Snowy, who at this point can actually talk out loud already. Um, and by the way, this, so this, this happened in episodes. It was like basically reports each week. And then after, it was so successful that at the end of the run, they actually decided to put it together in a book. And so this was then collected. And when he did it as a book, he kind of reworked it a bit to make it more um, a continuous narrative. Um, and this is the style that it was in. Um, which if you've ever seen the Ten Tens, you realize that they don't look like this at all because they all were redone starting the, in the early 40s uh, in the new style that he, he developed as he was working on. So there's also this bit about elections, which is, you know, he's, he's just had dinner and he, the guy who's uh, pretending to be an old um, peasant guy turns out to be a Soviet agent. And he, of course, being 1010, um, um, prevails over him. And he's walking around and he goes, oh, look, a meeting, you know, comrades, it's elections for the Soviet. And then there's this three panel page where they go, you know, we're gonna have these elections, and then they hold up the guns, and they say, anybody wants, wants to vote against us? And they go, hey, we won! The party's in uh, unanimous again. Again, a piece of uh, anti-Soviet propaganda. And I have to say, I read a lot of 1010s, in fact, all of them, and this is the least pleasant one, because it really just is one of these sort of, like, ideological uh, sketches, I guess you call them, after this. So this is bread lines. He talks about, look what, what the Soviets had done for the beautiful city of Moscow, a stinking slum. What's that queue of wretched children? So he brings in the children, which again is the sort of audience for these, supposedly. Um, oh, and they show me free bread. He goes, are you a communist? The little boy says, yes, and he gets some bread. The next boy says, no, and he gets kicked to the street. The feast, I'll teach him a lesson. So as usual, they, they have, this guy finally, this has come up as later in the comic. Um, so that was really, that's essentially the, so the, the idea is that the comic really was functioning at this time as a uh, sort of a propaganda piece for the Catholic right um, in Belgium. 
uh, against the sort of liberal media establishment that was founded at the time. And Hergé, whose real name was George Remy, um, he was Catholic, but he, wa he wasn't, the, all, if you read the interviews with him, he really didn't even think about the politics as much as what would make the publisher happy so I could get the comic published. And all the way through, he's, early on he says, you know, I wasn't really thinking of the politics at all, I was totally blind to it. In fact, he didn't go to the Soviet Union, he didn't go to the Congo, he didn't bother to research it. He just basically looked at some magazines and then drew from that. And so the Congo, which is the one you can't actually get easily in the U.S. because it's pretty racist, in fact, I just got a little glimpse of it, but the, the uh, Congolese are all portrayed in that sort of mushmouth minstrel style, which unfortunately, if you look at the history of comics way back in the 20s up to the 70s, in fact, with Robert Crumb, you still have that going on. Um, that's kind of way African-American people, black people are portrayed. Um, anyway, so I got this because I wanted to be, I'm a completist, I have to see everything, so I got this, I, I got the new version, he redid it in the 40s to make it less awful, um, but this is the original version, and what struck me is, so Tintin as colonialist, basically the, the Belgian Congo, right, and his treatment of animals. So if you see up here, this is the, the, his sidekick character, which is one of the Congolese. Now what, there's a weird little interesting side note to this, and if you've ever seen Marlon Riggs's um, videotape on, called Ethnic Notions, there's this sort of um, odd desire repul revulsion, and there are people who collect um, racist memorabilia who are African American, there's a similar thing going on with this. This is a very popular, still very popular comic in the Congo. One of the reasons probably is because the Congo has not been represented at all in, through European art, uh, or, or comics, I should say. Um, and so this is a one that focuses on them completely. It's still totally strange because they're treated awfully, they're drawn awfully. But what really struck me, the reason I put this page in is, here's Tintin being the hunter. He's going out to hunt antelope. So he says, look over there, an antelope, bang, huh? Well, Tintin, bang. Huh? He has a bit of target practice. I don't understand the creature is indestructible. What do, you, do you think he'll hit it today? At last, I can't think why I had to use 15 shots to go in at about time. And then there's like a whole pile of dead antelope, which by today's standards is pretty awful, right? And I was struck by, I'd never read that before about the comic that it focuses on the racism, but the sort of destruction of animals, which gets worse here because here's a monkey who decides to take Snowy, and he, um, oh, I think I did the wrong order. No, I guess I did but back, back, back. Oh, anyway, so this monkey takes Snowy, and Tintin's upset because the monkey has Snowy. So he shoots another monkey from the same family and then s s skins him and wears it in his costume to trick the monkey into giving him Snowy back, which again, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but that seems awful, doesn't it? Anyway, so he got a lot of criticism for those, uh, for the racism, for the sort of, uh, you know, abuse of animals, the general colonial nature, and also the sort of right-wing conservative side of it. And so he did actually do some soul searching um, and started realizing, well, maybe I should research what I'm writing about. Maybe I should do a little bit of like um, actual uh, learning what's going on. So he actually, the, the first one he did, which is the Blue Lotus, which I believe is the fourth one in, fifth one in, um, he actually did research on China and it still has stereotypes going on in it, which is typical of the 1930s, but it actually has a little critique of the colonialist folks. So this guy walking down the street with the rickshaw that's got, got Tintin in it, the drawing improves, by the way, this is the redone version from the 40s, right? Um, and this British guy runs into the um, rickshaw guy and starts beating him and calling him names, and then Tintin objects and says, brute! And then there's this, this character turns out to be the villain of the piece later on and becomes, and he's, he's still rude to these. So there's this implicit critique of the sort of like white um, imperialist in the, the East at the time. Um, and also, more importantly in this strip, he meets Chang. And Chang is this young guy. By the way, if you notice, I've been reading a lot of these strips at this time. There's a lot of the sort of pigeon, sort of choppy sing-song way that characters speak in like Terry and the Pirates and stuff. And Chang actually gets to talk in, conventional English, originally the original was uh, French, um, and he becomes friends with Tintin, who, although Tintin acts like an adult, you can see he's about the same age as Chang is supposed to be. So they become friends, and that's at the end of it, Chang helps him out of a couple of scrapes, and at the end of the strip, Chang goes off to his family in Hong Kong, and Tintin goes on to his next adventure, which is not Black Island, but there's a one in between. But Black Island, I want to show you one thing real quick, back to animals. So in Black Island, which takes place on an island in Scotland, 
um, which has this monster that everybody's afraid of going to the castle. It turns out it's supposed to be keeping a, a, the gold safe in the, in, the, in the basement. There's actually gorilla that somebody's put on this island. And the gorilla now is rendered more realistically. Again, this is the redone version, but more realistically, it's also a certain more comic effect, and it's not quite so vitally brutal, although it is sort of for slapstick. And again, the monkey, just like the previous one, grabs to Snowy, but this time Snowy goes, whoa, and the gorilla runs off. Um, so I just want to show you that because it, it, these all come together later in another comic. And so in The Crab of the Golden Claws, which is 1941, it was redone in 43. This is when they all started, the, the two trajectories of the original comic and the book sort of went together. He introduces, Hergé introduces Captain Haddock, but Haddock, if you're familiar with the comic strip, the Captain Haddock character, is portrayed originally as just an alcoholic captain who happens to be in a room that Tintin is trying to escape from the bad guys and throws his wooden sticks in to try to be able to climb up the side of the ship and it hits, and it hits uh, Haddock in the head and Haddock says, you know, I'm drinking and you know, blah, 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 anyway. So throughout that, he becomes friends with Tintin and then from then on he becomes a sort of secondary father figure to uh, Tintin. The mysterious missing father is never really shown, but Haddock becomes his partner and um, his father figure. Still has a drinking problem throughout the entire thing. It's, a, it's an ongoing joke from the, all the way through. In fact, he almost kills him on the moon because he gets drunk instead of watching the controls. In fact, here he is. Explorers on the Moon. I just want to show this 1954. So if you notice by then, the color comics were being done the way that the, uh, as the first uh, iteration of the comic, and that was it. Um, Explorers on the Moon, though, I'll we'll call it the Tintin Factory in realism. Tintin Factory essentially. Um, he got all these assistants that really were excellent draftspeople. Um, and the, the, if you look at the comics of this period, the backgrounds get quite much more realistic. There's a guy who did backgrounds. There was also a person who did all these sort of like mechanical objects. And essentially what Hergé did was the faces and sometimes the shoulders and stuff. He did the face, which is pretty typical actually. If you, again, if you follow American cartoonists like Milton Kniff from uh, Terry and the Pirates or um, Alex Raymond. There was a lot of them that actually had assistants that worked for, and did most of the uh, other stuff, and they did the details of the faces of the characters. But anyway, so they're, here they are on the moon, and Captain Haddock, is he in this one? Yeah, Captain Haddock is now fully ensconced as a comic character, but also as a, um, as a, um, again, sort of like companion, but also the sort of odd father figure to uh, Tintin. Um, I was going to say, oh yeah, this one, so there, the, this is a two-parter also, it's quite a long one, a two-parter, and in this one, they try to escape in the moon, and um, there's a lot of stuff about, uh, about oxygen and how, how you can stay awake for a certain amount of time, which, by the way, is pretty scrupulously researched and actually has a feel of realism about it, even though um, at the time, obviously, we had not been to the moon, but it's a fair, if you read it in retrospect, it's actually fairly accurate about uh, portraying the, the, the moon and how it would be to be on the surface. Anyway, so this is what I was trying to get to. So if you look, think back to what, you, what I just showed you about Tintin and the land of Soviets, um, and Tintin, um, sorry, and the, the Congo, Tibet is considered like the sort of masterwork of the series. Um, and actually, it's exactly what you would think it would be, Tintin and Tibet, 1960. Um, this isn't very good because I couldn't find a kind of odd, good online version of it, but this is the second page, and um, Haddock and Tintin are playing um, chess, and he's sort of dozing off in each panel, and there's this woman in the background doing various sort of business. And then suddenly he goes, Chang! Which of course is his friend from back in the Blue, Blue Lotus, which has been referred to throughout the strip, and here's a better version of that. Um, which one shows you the draftsmanship of the comic at this point compared to the early, the early work. Also shows you the various types of in this case, European characters that are, he sort of like um, have become sort of like standard stock and trade of European comics at this time, thanks to Urge actually. Um, and this is also another character, uh, uh, the, the um, do, uh, what is he? he's a scientist, but I think he's a doctor, Dr. Uh, Calculus, and that Dr. Um, and anyway, so this is kind of a nice setup here. But what 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 is about this strip that one is he's dozing off, so there's this idea of this unconscious sort of like. And he, he basically says, Chang's in trouble. And then the whole rest of the comic is that he's trying to figure out what happened to Chang, and it turns out that Chang was flying from Hong Kong to visit um, England, and his plane crashed in Tibet, and everybody was presumed dead. They, they found the crash site, but, but Chang was not there, but everyone else is dead. He's sure Chang is alive, 
and he wants to climb. So the idea of this bond between Chang and him all the way back to the 30s in the original comic strip is, has been considered significant as far as the transformation in Hergé as a, as a cartoonist and thinker and how we looked at his characters. Um, anyway, so I just want to show a couple of these things. So also, the, the, if you remember that three panel one of the election and the way that worked, he's still working that out. And you know, there's this lovely setup where he, they're hiking through the, through the countryside in Tibet and um, Haddock is, you know, I'm gonna go walking ahead, it's great. The Sherpa who's leading the exhibition, ex, exhibition and, ex, exhibition and um, expedition, sorry, and Tintin um, are falling behind and then there's the other Sherpas and then pretty soon Haddock is wearing out and they're still going at the same speed, they're still going at the same speed, the Sherpas are passing and Haddock's way back there. And what we, what we know as readers is that Haddock has been drinking the whole time. So he's been drinking because whiskey will make him, of course the elevation of whiskey makes him a completely useless companion at some point. In fact, he gets trapped on a rock base where he has to be saved by the Sherpa. But I wanted to show you this. Is, so that's Chang in this iteration, and that's also the Yeti. And the Yeti is one more version of that um, ape figure. So the ape has gone from being this figure who stole Snowy, he has to kill another ape to pretend he's an ape to get Snowy back, to the gorilla in the castle, which is essentially a boogeyman, to this character who is a boogeyman at start, but it turns out the reason they didn't find Chang was because the Yeti saved him from the crash, took him to a cave and basically treated him as a son, which is another weird father figure in there. Um, and so um, throughout, you, the, the, basically the rest of the, the end of the story, they have to try to get the Yeti, the Yeti to give up Chang. And at the, uh, and, and at the end of the um, book, that's the last panel of the book, they rescue Chang, the, the, they actually meet Buddhist monks who basically save them, and they're, they're treated pretty well as well as far as the characterizations of them. They're, not seen as, they're no longer seen as a joke or a, a sort of inside gag or something. They're actually seen as like Buddhists who happen to be up in Tibet. And they happen to be at the right place at the right time to say Tintin, which is the, the convenience of the narratives for Tintin. But anyway, this what I kind of see is kind of a heartbreaking panel, actually, because his one child essentially has been taken away by Tintin and Captain Haddock and the and the Buddhists, and he's just kind of longingly looking after Chang as he's leaving. So he has this strong attachment to Chang as Tintin does, which is an interesting little uh, reversal in relation to the way the characters. And then finally, I just show this. I know this is going way too fast. But finally, in 76, there's Tintin and Picaros, which is an ambivalent end at best. But Tintin, I mean, I'm sorry, Herge died like about five or six years later and never, never did a finished piece. There's another one called Tintin and, and Alf Art, which is kind of the sketches he did for a final one, but it didn't happen. But this is the last one. And oddly enough, and, and there's no real, there's no real, really great single page to show you, but this is kind of, uh, a little bit uh, shows you the general idea, which is, does he have revolutionary sympathies? This is 1976, and he's in Latin America, and he's being chased by the generals of some country that may or may not exist. Um, and he's sympathetic with the Indians that are there, but he's negotiating basically between the bad generals and the revolutionaries, who are also all exploiting the Indians, and the generals have dropped um, alcohol down to get the Indians drunk, and then the revolutionaries T upset because they won't follow his rule. But, but in the middle of it is Tintin negotiating between the three parties and also excusing, um, trying to, to, to make the, put the um, uh, Indians in a better light with the revolutionaries so they won't basically off them. And there's even a point, I couldn't find it today, but there's a point in here where he's actually wearing a jacket of one of the revolutionaries. So it's a kind of a weird trajectory from the Soviet, um, where he's basically doing anti-communist critique to this, as we know from the, the various groups in Latin America during the 70s, late 60s, 70s, they were mostly Marxist revolutionaries. He, it's never mentioned, but essentially the sympathies have shifted. So I think that trajectory is an interesting little uh, cross. And again, it also reflects the sort of the, the, the ideological, one ideological trajectory across Europe, obviously, right, throughout the 20th century, which is where we end up here. So anyway, so, that, so what I was gonna say at that point was thoughts, but you know, Hello, camera. Thoughts? Anyway, um, so that's me. So. Any questions? Yeah. Thoughts? Thank you. I mean, I, noticed, I, I thought in terms of really like just kind of a, of a swoop across and then we could talk about any individual things. I mean, the things obviously that I thought were interesting was the, the kind of idea of colonialism as being the sort of normative idea behind the comic itself. 
that then still continues that because you know essentially every comic is he goes to a different country or one case he goes to the moon and he's always this almost like superhero figure. I don't know if you guys got that from when you read as a character, but he's really like Superman. He never, nothing ever really bad happens to him. He gets a bump in the head or he gets knocked down or whatever, but you know, he's almost indestructible. Haddock is also indestructible. He does have like that scene with the walking where he's like that vulnerable, but Tintin rarely has a moment. Even when he's in, a, in, in the t Tibet book, he's in an ice cave. He manages to survive for a week in the ice cave by lighting matches and he finally gets himself out. And, you know, the Buddhists save him, but the, all the way through there's these groups that save the, save the character. But essentially it's colonialism, European colonialism written into a comic book. But it, it does mitigate as it goes because the people who he inter, interacts with are one are treated better and also are more, um, more favorably represented, which is an unusual thing, especially for comics. I mean, in general, uh, they tend to work on stereotypes and sort of uh, archetypal figures at, at best, which is a lot of figures. Also the idea of the animals and the way in which animals are treated early on, and then again, how there's a developing sense of the sort of, it, it anthropomorphizes the animals, but it still gives them some agency that they didn't have in the earlier one. They're essentially just an obstacle to overcome, which is the way the, the communists were essentially as well. And then the last theme, of course, is the idea of the, the, the father figures, but also the brother figure in the sense of Chang. So the father figure being, being like Captain Haddock, but also like this uh, father relationship with the Yeti and, the, and uh, Chang, but also his sort of, almost like psychic bond with Chang that happened early on in the 30s and it's being replayed as a sort of like adventure story to save this guy who everybody, and if you read the comic, you realize every single person is sure he's dead. And when they finally find the, the wreckage, which I didn't put up here, but there's a beautiful picture of this plane in the snow up in the mountains. Um, and sure enough, Chang's out there. And the only thing that keeps him from totally just abandoning it is they see a yellow scarf up in the mountain, up in the hill in the mountains, and that's uh, Chang's scarf. And so that, uh, convinces Tintin that he didn't die in the crash, that he actually has, he's, he's gone away from it. But again, that the emphasis is on the psychic link between the two characters, so this sort of like connection between them. But then again, there's this sort of doubling of the tragic link between the Yeti and Chang as his child, which is a sort of fatherless child, which is uh, Hergé's sort of entire strip is kind of built around that notion of the, the, the child adult who doesn't have a father figure at all, right? So anyway, that was my summation. Any questions or thoughts? Or? I, uh, I find all the planes in Paris. Oh, yeah. And, you know, like the first main part is all in China and Hong Kong. Yeah. So it was really interesting because the, the Chinese characters were a lot different in that compared to what you showed us. Yeah, I just got to reading the. Did you read? You've read the whole thing? Yeah. So I read the second volume. I have the other ones, I, I haven't uh, read them. I, yeah, I have like this, this collection that has just like all of them. Oh, yeah. I guess he, that guy was a um, famous progressive because of his like use of really strong female characters. Well. Yeah, yeah. But it was really racist. Yeah, I have to say though, you know, that that, that, that so the, the one I read, I think it was like thirty six to thirty eight, I think that time period, mm -hmm. and and every time um, Connie and yeah. Big Stoop or the two yeah. the two yeah. Chinese characters, every time you just think like, oh yeah, they're doing, this, and then they're they're seen as the butt of jokes again. Yeah. And they also have that sort of vocal pattern that's like typical yeah. 1930s. Yeah, and like the way they're drawn is almost like uh, San Franciscan, like back in the old days when there was like, like the, the propaganda against Chinese people. Right, well if you, if, you, if you look at them side by side, you can see that Connie is essentially the yellow kid, which was the first comic strip ever, and it's basically making fun of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And it was from San Francisco for the Hearst Papers, and of course it was the Chinese immigrants who were being made fun of. But if you look at Connie, essentially Connie is the copy of the yellow kid, only a more adult version, but it's essentially the same idea, which is, you know, it's, yeah, I, I have to say, I, I loved Milton Kniff's work when I was a kid, but I, when I was a kid, it was like in the 70s, so it was long after that, it was Steve Canyon, which was his later strip, mm -hmm. but I have to say, you know, I thought, oh, I really, you know, I just love his work, I'll go back and look at this, but I look at him going like, yeah, so I have a couple other ones, I can't even, one day I'll pull them out and read them, I love looking at the artwork, but reading the stories, I'm just going, oh, man, and even the, I have to say, even the women characters, there's a lot of this sort of like, typical positioning of the characters is either evil or good, evil or good. Or they're evil, but they fall, still somehow fall in love with the... Well, yeah. <laughs> right. well, I mean, and the Steve Canyon strip is like that a lot, which is like essentially every single female character has to fall in love with the Steve Canyon character because that's the only guy's story he can trot out, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to say, Tintin, 
which has a lot of similarities. And with the Haddock character, it's kind of like Pat Ryan, which is the, we're getting totally into Terry and the Pirates here. But, um, and, you know, Ten Tens are like the Terry character. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a much more visualized world, and it has a much more, it, it, and weird, it's weirdly like, because it really plays on the sort of notion of child and adult in a way that I think is really kind of an interesting, um, an interesting dynamic because also it has this, it also has this sort of like adult themes that aren't, you know, like uh, you've, I'm sure you've seen Warner Brother cartoons like Bugs Bunny and those kind of things. And there's adult stuff going on or obviously The Simpsons, right? There's a lot of adult stuff going on, but there's also a way that children can read it and see it as, um, as being a kid's thing, right? Mm -hmm. Tintin does a really great job of like keeping the tone very light, but also having some really dark things going underneath, which by the way, are very much like fairy tales. Right. So there's a kid thing going on there where you have these seemingly light and airy adventures and then underneath are these weird things like militarism and, and you know, this whole thing about like what is it to do with the animal and the violence and there's all this sort of like, you know, action and stuff going on. But it's, and it's pretty can grim at times, but I, I think that's an interesting mix that I don't think that like Terry and the Pirates ever really got or a lot of those other strips, like they, they, they don't have quite the same sensibility that I think that Perger brings to it, right? Mm -hmm. As well as a conservative <laughs> bit at the beginning at least, right? Yeah. I'm glad I came today because I read these when I was like around 10. Oh, yeah. So I understand like the true meaning of maybe like the reason behind the artists, uh, why he made these books. I'm glad I came. I would, I would say, I would say, don't say a true reading. Say a a, a, um, a reading of sorts because I'm not sure. It, it's certainly one way you can read them because yeah. I've read other stuff that like, like in fact, I, the class I teach, there's an article I have them read, which is, which I kind of alluded to, which is totally about the idea of the absent father and what that means to the structuring all the various episodes as it goes. And the idea that Tintin up until um, the late 30s, that one I showed you, he, he's basically by himself and he has other characters who come in and sort of, but they act as sort of like, you know, introducing plot lines or those kind of things. But until Captain Haddock comes in, he doesn't really have a father figure. And so there's always this sort of like absent father. There's this idea of absent present, you know, like the absence makes it obvious that there's somebody missing. And then when Captain Haddock comes in, he plays so many different roles. It's still like, well, wait, is Tintin an adult? Or <laughs> he wears like a trench coat. He works for a newspaper. And yet he's depicted as oh, probably like 12, I would guess, or 15 at best, right? Um, so that, that, that's, so the, the point being is there's lots of different readings you can have of this. This is certainly one idea about it. Um, but I have to say the same thing. I read them when I was a kid, and I just thought they were cool stories. And I remember having them all over the house and you know, various editions. And then when I went to read them as an adult, I went, oh, in fact, I've been doing it. I, I fly up here each week on the airplane. Um, and so it turns out that a 1010 works exactly in the 50-minute flight from LA. So I bring them, I throw them in the bag. I start it when the plane takes off, and I'm done right when I land in, in Oakland. Um, and so it's kind of a perfect, you know, I mean, there's something about it that's a perfect reading length. Um, and, the, and again, I, I feel like a dork sitting on the plane reading these kids' right. stories. But there's been points where I'll be sitting on the plane halfway through, and I'll go, oh, what? What? Like the story will actually like have grabbed me such to the point where I'll actually like audibly say something. The person next to me will be going, "What? What is he doing?" Mm -hmm. And I'm going, like, oh, I don't know. "Let me just slide this out of the way." But anyway, so yeah. No, I just like how it like drew in real world issues. You never talked about politics as much. You didn't really realize what that means. Like, yeah, I mean that's a you know, we could have a whole other. Um, well, you can take my class in fact. We have a whole other thing you could talk about the different ways in which the the real world kind of comes into these stories, even like I was talking earlier about the superhero stories, you know, the, the superhero tales, none of them are actually innocent of the sort of politics of the moment, right? Or the sort of social things going on at the time. Some of the, they, they sometimes try to address them more directly, but if you live in the world, as cartoonists do, just like everybody else, they sort of come into the stories. I mean, I don't think they, I don't think they sit and purposely put them in, but just by living in the world, you sort of, those things become part of your stories, right? So. Do you know how many people read this comic when it was um, I don't know exact numbers, but I'll tell you this is this is essentially the most popular European comic ever. In fact, so much so that there was a magazine in the 40s, I think it was, which is why these started getting redone, called Tintin. And it, you know, for a, for a long time, Tintin ran in it, but I think, I believe it may have ended, but it ran for a long time after Hergé died. And it was really a place for a lot of new cartoonists to come in, and a lot like of the- Like a comic book magazine. Yeah, like a comic book magazine. You know, because in Europe, they have this tradition of comic magazines that are like big size, like- They do that in Asia. Exactly. Yeah, pretty, pretty similar. yeah, I mean, if, well, in fact, in my class, I have, a, I have a, you know, the American comics, but then I do European comics, and then I do manga or you know, Asian comics because those are the two, three big, you know, places where those things. There's, there's all throughout the world people have done comics, but those are definitely the ones that uh, are the biggest industries where people and they have long traditions and long histories. 
the manga, as you know, has a lot of um, uh, owes a lot to Walt Disney uh, because uh, Tetsuan Adam and uh, was, uh, what is it um, Ozumu? He he actually like Astro Boy, which is one of my favorite characters ever. Um, is essentially Mickey Mouse. If you look at his little hat and the way he looks, it's very much like Mickey Mouse. Look at him. Look. Yeah, you know how his hair is kind of well. Yeah, hat right. It's his hair. Oh, but it's, it looks like a little mouse, uh, the Mickey Mouse hat, which is because uh, he just loved that character. So there's a lot of inter, there's a lot of interplay between the various industries in a way that you don't always, it isn't always obvious in the, in the characters. I wouldn't be surprised actually, if back to Milton Kniff, if he hadn't seen some Tin Tens at some point because there's just such a weird similarity. It's in China and there's a lot of the first big adventure that was that, that, that Blue Lotus one was really distributed widely and it was in China as well. So I know there's a lot of kind of similarities there. Any thoughts? No question. So obviously Tintin started as a juvenile comic out of necessity. It sounds like he was drawing for that audience. Yeah. But uh, over time it stands alone. Um, is there, uh, do you have a comment on like the uniqueness of a juvenile character or the, the, the power that the comic has because it, it's both a kid and an adult and kind of the ambiguity? You know, I think it, what's interesting about that is it shows you more about the culture that they were produced in because, again, like the a Japanese and, and Asian market. Um, in the U.S., because of the way in which it sort of became a superhero thing, I mean, literally, comics were originally, you know, in the newspapers as a way to sell the newspapers. And they started out as doing gags, but then they moved into these adventure strips and then sort of getting an older audience. And so then comic strips sort of got this notion of being for a wider range of people. And when comics started out, they really did um, have a range of comics as well. They had war comics, romance comics, you know, comics based on Jerry Lewis and various celebrities. But then when the superhero boom started in the 60s, it really became like just simply kids related, right? I mean, there, it always had, always had that sort of thing connected back to the 40s when they first started with Superman. Superman, et cetera. Um, but in America, they always were sort of seen as like a juvenile. In fact, if you know anything about the, uh, about the Wortham uh, seduction of the innocent, you know, a lot of uh, the issues around juvenile delinquency in the 50s was actually hung on comics as being a bad influence on kids, right? But in Europe and in Asia, they quickly became an adult thing as well. In fact, I, I haven't actually seen this in person, but I've read stories how in Japan, you know, on the, on the trains, you'll see people reading manga all over the place. They have manga for instruction, they have manga for different audiences, ages, and everything. And it's just considered something you do, it's like another form of literature, right? You can read whatever kind of book you want on the train, but it could be a comic book. Whereas here is, again, I even feel weird on the plane with Tintin going like, why is this guy with a beard? And, and, and people on the plane, by the way, have said to me, are you a professor? And I go, oh, this is so obvious, oh my god. Um, but, you know, essentially um, sitting there with the, my 10 10, I even feel sort of self conscious about, like, why am I reading this thing for kids? Almost if I have to explain to them, like, I have children, and this is from their collection. Whereas in, you know, Europe, right, 10 10 quickly caught on with a wider audience, and, and the later stories actually, he really played with that dynamic because he knew his audience at that point was no longer just children, but they were children. There was children as part of it, but also. There was an older group reading it as well, and those stories had to be written that way to appeal to those two audiences. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the comic strips from the, uh, during the war period um, in the U.S. took on a decidedly more patriotic, but also a, um, a much more like um, aggressive and violent uh, tendencies, and there was a lot of complaints during the 40s about how the comic strip should be still for kids and it shouldn't be for adults, and why are we talking about the war in Europe, and why are we talking about the war in Asia? It should really be focused on, and, and the cartoonists were really pushing back against that, saying like, well, this is the real world we're living in right now, we're at war throughout the world, we should be reflecting in the comics. And that battle, you know, it was always kind of tenuous, but it's still, there was a moment where the comics were seen as being more adult, but there was people already saying that that's, that's not good, they're only meant for kids, and the kids should be exposed to like airplane combat or people shooting at each other or whatever, right? If you've ever seen the EC comics from the early 50s, is which ones that caused the, caused the comics code, they're pretty horrible. There's like axes and murders and heads all over the place. And, you know, and they weren't meant for kids, but as we know, kids will get all sorts of stuff and look at them. <laughs> so there was definitely a corruption, a corrupting influence there somewhere. But you know, I think that's the, that's the answer, is a society that create, that the comics fit into have different notions about what that media actually contributes or engages with in the, in the, in the larger social issues, right? In Asia and, and uh, Europe, it, 
became like an adult thing to do and there's no stigma around it in the US unless you're reading Mouse, which we all, <laughs> which I think everybody reads here. You guys read that yet? Yeah. yeah. Mouse, you know, and so, what's that? You read with your yeah, cool. Awesome. I'm actually, yeah, I'm, I'm doing it. The, the thing I'm working on right now is actually about a, they're doing a virtual um, version of a Holocaust survivor on a screen. So instead of this, you have a person sitting there and you talk to them and the person would tell you stories about what it was like to be in the concentration camps and stuff. So I've so gone back to, what's that? You're talking to the screen. Yeah, and, and it has voice recognition. It has, uh, it follows you. And if you're looking at it, it, the, it will kind of look at you and, and, and it talk, it's great because actually the guy's 85 and he's, 80, 89? He won't be around much longer, and then you've got all this testimony of what it was like to live, and, and, and actually he was in five, I think, at different camps. But the point being that I've gone back to Mouse because we kept talking about the notion of how you represent um, traumatic events like that. And one way is Mouse does a really amazing, I don't, I don't know if you remember it, but there's that point at the end where, um, uh, what is it, what's the dad's name, Vlad? says to Artie, um, you know, as he's dying, basically, the last, last time he sees him, he goes, Richelieu, which is Artie's brother who died in, in, you know, by the Nazis back in World War II, and here it is 40 years later, and uh, Vlad has still not overcome the trauma of having his oldest son, you know, taken away and, and gotten rid of, and, you know, that, that sort of notion of that emotional connect that gives you an, an entrance into a sort of traumatic event that we can't even imagine. Um, I think that Mouse does an amazingly great job of that. Now, the point being that I don't feel bad reading Mouse on the train or on the plane, but Mouse has this sort of singularity around it, right? But most comics still have this sort of idea of like, you know, for little kids or whatever, right? So it's not art, it's, it's trash or things you might toss afterwards, right? So Mouse though is art, because we know it because we teach it here at seminars, so it must be, <laughs> must be high culture, right? Yeah. Well, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.